Thing. Order! Oh, order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Russia hit back at Britain today, demanding evidence that a nerve agent was used to attack the former spy Sergei Skripal and his daughter Yulia in Salisbury. Moscow has until midnight to explain how the deadly Russian-made substance was used on UK soil, or, Theresa May says, there will be a strong response. Tonight, the war of words escalated further, with Russia warning it will react, and President Trump saying he is with the UK all the way. Our political correspondent Romilly Weeks has the latest. With the evidence trail pointing one way and one way only from Salisbury back to Moscow, the attempted murder of a Russian spy and his daughter has set the Prime Minister head to head with President Putin as the deadline nears for Russia to come up with an explanation for how a Russian made nerve agent was deployed on British streets. The use of this nerve agent would represent the first use of nerve agents uh, on the continent of Europe since the Second World War. Uh, we will make sure that our response is, as I told the House last week, is, is commensurate uh, but robust. If Moscow is worried, it's not sounding it. The Foreign Minister, Sergei Lavrov, called the accusations nonsense. And insisted that the UK hand over a sample of the nerve agent before it will respond. The UK then now looking to its allies for support. It sounds to me like they believe it was Russia, and I would certainly take that finding as fact. The president, after a call with Mrs May, pledged to stand in solidarity with the UK and agreed on the need for consequences. So if the Russians do refuse to cooperate, what options are open to the prime minister? They could include the expulsion of diplomats, refusing entry to the UK and freezing the assets of oligarchs and friends of President Putin, a NATO-led military response, increasing troop numbers in countries on Russia's borders, a possible boycott of the World Cup by British officials, and more covert measures such as a cyber counterattack against state computer networks. I think what it should be trying to achieve is that in the eyes of the Russian government there's a price to be paid for behaving in this way. And that's one of the reasons why I think we can only do it effectively if we do it with our allies. Because the price has to be bigger than one that the, uh, that the UK alone can exact. While police cordon off yet more areas in their search of Salisbury, behind the scenes Downing Street is trying to build an international alliance in support of tough action, even as the Russian embassy is warning darkly this evening that punitive measures will be met with their own response. Romilly Weeks, ITV News. Well, police have revealed more details today about the movements of Sergei Skripal and his daughter Yulia in the hours before they were poisoned. And Rupert Evelyn is in Salisbury for us tonight. So, Rupert, what have the investigators been saying? Well, they confirmed today that Yulia flew into the country the day before the suspected poisoning. That was on Saturday, the 4th of March. But what they were really interested in was a sort of 45-minute window on the Sunday itself in which they want to know or hear from people, members of the public, about the car, the same BMW that's being examined very closely, forensically and extremely safely uh, in the, behind the cordon uh, behind me here. Police are very keen to track down that movement of that car on the Sunday afternoon. They also expanded on the amount of people that have been treated as part of this investigation. The latest assessments reveal that 38 people have been seen in relation to this incident. Of those 34 have been assessed, and I make this clear, have been discharged from hospital. Three remain in hospital, and that is Sergei, Yulia and Nick, and one person continues to be monitored as an outpatient. Well, the police uh, did say that the people of Salisbury can expect to see an awful lot of activity in the coming days. Indeed, uh, within the last hour or so, back near where the park bench is, has another cordon been put up in place. It is a busy crime scene and a busy city as police try to establish still what happened here. Rupert in Salisbury, thank you. 
Well, as the diplomatic row deepens, the UK's ambassador to Russia was summoned to Moscow's foreign ministry. Laurie Bristow told officials that Britain wants an explanation. It's not yet clear what action the UK could take if it doesn't get one. But as our political correspondent Carl Dinan reports from Moscow, Russians have little fear of international pressure. Britain's ambassador to Russia met the deputy foreign minister here today. I reiterated the points made by Prime Minister May uh, that we expect by the end of today an account from the Russian state as to how this material came to be used in Salisbury. But as the deadline approaches, Putin loyalists say they don't fear British retribution. We don't have a really good context with British business right now. So if British companies will stay away from Russian market, this will harm British business, not Russian one. But EU sanctions could hit Russia's economy, and business thinks the Kremlin would think twice about retaliation. They want to keep bad politics in one drawer and good business in another. In other words, they do not want to uh, contribute to any escalation in sanctions, which makes it more difficult for foreign companies from any country coming to Russia and investment, because they need the money. But sanctions don't look likely to affect public opinion. I don't think Russia cares about future sanctions because we already have enough sanctions against us. They don't bother me because they have no influence on my life at all. Other punishments also have drawbacks. Perhaps the most high-profile option for hitting back at the Kremlin would be to lead some kind of boycott of the World Cup, due to begin here in just over 90 days' time. But linking sport and politics like that is always controversial and likely to prove just as unpopular at home as it would do here. Meanwhile, the foreign ministry here still cracks jokes, wondering if Russia would be blamed for the recent cold snap. A more serious problem for Britain is Russia's historic ability to soak up international pressure. It's a matter of national pride. Carl Dinan, ITV News, Moscow. Tonight, there is another new twist after a Russian exile was found dead in his home in unexplained circumstances. Counter-terror police are investigating now, and Angus Walker is outside the house in southwest London. Angus, what have you been able to find out? Well, forensic teams are still at work in the tents outside this house in suburban southwest London, where Nikolai Glushkov lived, a Russian exile in his 60s, his death unexplained, the police say, but counter-terror detectives in charge of the investigation because of what they say are the associations he had. Now, he was the deputy director of Aeroflot, the Russian state airline. He fell out with the Kremlin. He sought political exile here. He was friends with Boris Berezovsky, another exile, who was found dead in 2013. So, unsurprising that attention is being drawn on this particular death at the moment. It is unexplained at the moment because, but because of his links with other exiles and because of his history in falling out with the Kremlin. The detectives from Counter-Terror Command have been deployed here. No link is being drawn between this death and the attack in Salisbury. The police are keen to insist at this stage. All right, Angus Walker in South West London, thank you. And uh, our security editor Rohit Katru is here. There's so much is happening, it's difficult to keep tabs on it. What happens next? Well, I should say, first of all, looking at that investigation in southwest London, note the background, the scene behind Angus Walker. No sign of hazmat suits or any specialist officers. The fact that is being led by counterterrorism police um, is really uh, a to point out the abundance of absolute caution here. Um, it's an indication, too, of the seriousness with which everything now remotely related to this issue of Salisbury related to Russia is now being treated. Um, diplomatically, today, there have been expressions of solidarity from Donald Trump, as we saw, a phone call between Theresa May and Angela Merkel um, this uh, afternoon. And so what happens when that deadline passes at midnight? Well, Almost certainly nothing. There is a package of measures ready to go following the National Security Council meeting uh, tomorrow. It is difficult to see what Britain can do on its own that will not be met with a shrug of the shoulders from Moscow. Ravi Katri, thank you. Well, tonight, President Trump, in a phone call to Theresa May, said he agreed the Russian government must provide unambiguous answers as to how the nerve agent came to be used in the Salisbury attack. Russia's dismissed claims of involvement as rubbish 
of the Government's Emergencies Committee, Cobra, met again, as police said their investigation is likely to take many weeks. Paul McNamara reports now from Salisbury. Nine days into this investigation, and less than five hours from a diplomatic deadline to explain why a Russian-made nerve agent was deployed on British streets. The attempted murders here in Salisbury have had ramifications around the world, enticing even reluctant critics of the Kremlin in from the cold. Theresa May is going to be speaking to me today. It sounds to me like they believe it was Russia, and I would certainly take that finding as fact. That support echoed by allies across Europe and apparently in somewhat stronger terms by Donald Trump's soon-to-be former Secretary of State, Rex Tillerson. I've been very encouraged so far by the strength of the support that we are getting. I think in particular from, uh, from President Macron of France, uh, from, I just talked to Sigmar Gabriel of uh, my German counterpart, and uh, from Washington, where Rex Tillerson last night made it absolutely clear that he sees this as part of a pattern of a disruptive behaviour, and increasingly a disruptive behaviour, malign behaviour, uh, by Russia. Sergei Skripal and his daughter Yulia remain in critical but stable condition, victims of an attack with a Russian nerve agent, Novichok. The UK's midnight deadline for an explanation of how that Novichok came to be used here, tonight looking unlikely to be met by Russia, who say they won't cooperate unless they get access to the substance. The country being questioned has the right to access the substance in question to carry out its own analysis. This is what we asked for as soon as the rumours first started being spread by practically every member of the British government. With Russia denying any involvement in this attempted double murder, all eyes tomorrow will be on Theresa May's response. Her options include expelling diplomats, visa restrictions, freezing financial assets and even boycotting the World Cup. But here in Salisbury, the massive police investigation into this attack continues apace. Officers issuing an appeal today for anyone who saw the screepals in their red BMW before it ended up in this supermarket car park. Still, though, no detail about how precisely they came to fall ill later that Sunday afternoon. We're, of course, getting many questions regarding how and where the nerve agent was actually administered. I can't comment on that at this time. Police also said they so far have no suspects or persons of interest. Though there is a nation of interest, of course, Russia, and they have until midnight to respond. Paul McNamara in Salisbury. Counterterrorism officers are investigating the death of a man in southwest London who was reportedly a Russian businessman. Scotland Yard said that the cause of his death is unexplained, although there is no evidence to suggest a link to the incident in Salisbury. Fatima Manji is live in New Malden. Fatima. John, there's a very much live police investigation going on behind me in that tent. In the last half an hour, we've seen a couple of officers take away what looked like bag, bags of evidence. Now, police were first called here at a quarter to 11 last night to deal with an unexplained death. Although the gentleman who died has not been formally identified, it's been widely reported that this was 69-year-old Russian businessman Nikolai Glushkov. Now, this is someone who was a one-time deputy director of the airline Aeroflot, a Russian exile, someone who had been in prison for five years in Russia after being charged with fraud. Uh, he later received asylum here in the UK. Uh, Mr. Glushkov was also a close friend of the late Russian oligarch and longtime Vladimir Putin opponent, Boris Berezovsky. Uh, now, Mr. Berezovsky died in 2013 in his UK home, apparently having hung himself in the bathroom. Uh, at the time, the coroner recorded a verdict of uh, uh, an open verdict. However, Mr. Glushkov was uh, suspicious about that death. Mr. Glushkov's own death is obviously now being investigated by counter-terrorism police. John. Fatima Manji in New Malden. There are just about two hours left to the deadline announced by Theresa May for Moscow to explain how a nerve agent, probably made in Russia, was used to attack a former spy and his daughter. Sergei Skripal and his daughter Yulia were taken ill over a week ago in Salisbury. The Kremlin said today it would not cooperate with any investigation until it was given a sample of the substance involved. As tensions deepened between London and Moscow, Scotland Yard gave more details of the attack and appealed for more witnesses. Our first report tonight is from our diplomatic correspondent, James Landale. 
It began as a brutal attack on the streets of Salisbury, the poisoning of a former Russian intelligence officer and his daughter. But it's become tonight a global diplomatic row, with Britain in confrontation with Moscow and looking for allies. The Kremlin has just two hours left to explain what role it played in Salisbury, to say how a nerve agent developed in Russia ended up here. And if midnight passes without that explanation, the government's promising a robust and extensive response. This is a, a brazen attempt to murder people, innocent people, on UK soil policemen still in hospital. Uh, overwhelmingly likely or highly likely that uh, the Russian state uh, was involved. And the use of this nerve agent would represent the first use of nerve agents uh, on the continent of Europe since the Second World War. As part of a huge diplomatic push, British diplomats told the chemical weapons watchdog in the Netherlands that Russia was implicated in the use of a nerve agent on British soil. The Foreign Secretary called his EU counterparts, securing expressions of support from France, Germany, the European Commission and NATO. This afternoon, Theresa May spoke to Donald Trump, who agreed with her that Russia must provide unambiguous answers about how this weapon came to be used in Britain. Even before the call, the president acknowledged Russia's involvement. Theresa May is going to be speaking to me today. It sounds to me like they believe it was Russia, and I would certainly take that finding as fact. As soon as we get the facts straight, if we agree with them, we will condemn Russia or whoever it may be. Russia is already subject to international sanctions because of its intervention in Ukraine and Crimea. Ministers insist these damage Russia's economy, but their impact on Moscow's behaviour is doubtful. Crucially, these are largely EU sanctions. The UK can't impose them on its own. So what unilateral options is the government considering? Well, some of Russia's 58 diplomats in London could be expelled, but that might provoke a tit-for-tat expulsion of British diplomats. Wealthy Russians in London with links to the Kremlin could face financial sanctions and travel bans. But who and how? There could be tougher laws to crack down on Russian officials guilty of human rights abuses. And Russian TV stations like RT could be targeted. The media regulators already warned it could lose its licence. Here at the Foreign Office, they're also investing a lot of effort and diplomacy in trying to bring international pressure to bear on Russia. But the bar is high. Russia has a veto at the UN and some EU countries are reluctant to contemplate yet more sanctions. This evening, the Russian embassy said Moscow would not respond to Britain's ultimatum unless it was given samples of the nerve agent, as diplomats promised retaliation against any punitive action. Russia is not a country to be spoken to in the language of ultimatums. I think it's high time uh, the United Kingdom learned that. Tonight, the investigation continues in Salisbury. Tomorrow, the diplomatic war of words will be replaced by deeds and outright confrontation. James Landell, BBC News. Well, as we mentioned, Russia has repeated its denial of any involvement in the nerve agent attack. The country's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, dismissed the accusation, while the Russian embassy in London warned that the threat of any sanctions by Britain would be met with a response. Uh, our correspondent Sarah Rainsford reports now from Moscow. Accused of a crime many miles from here, under pressure to explain a chemical attack that shocked Britain. But today, the Kremlin has remained silent. The foreign minister, though, was in full defensive flow. Sergei Lavrov rejected Britain's 24-hour ultimatum to respond to the claim Moscow used a nerve agent. Russia should get 10 days, he said, accusing Britain of flouting the Chemical Weapons Convention. And when I asked about the actual charge, the minister called that nonsense. Russia is not guilty. Russia is ready to cooperate in accordance with the Convention on the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons if the United Kingdom finally decides to fulfill its obligations under international law within that document. Russia is also demanding a sample of the substance used in the attack to do its own tests. It's been identified as Novichok, which the BBC believes was once produced here in a secret Soviet program. Reports in Moscow say any stockpiles were destroyed long ago. 
So when the British ambassador was called to the foreign ministry, Moscow says he came to hear its protest at a sordid attempt to discredit this country. I reiterated the points made by Prime Minister May uh, that we expect by the end of today an account from the Russian state as to how this material came to be used in Salisbury. Russia has always insisted it had nothing to do with the poisoning in Salisbury and that position clearly hasn't changed even with the threat of sanctions. After all, this is a country that's been living under international sanctions for some time linked to its actions in Ukraine. Now, those measures haven't weakened President Putin politically at all. If anything, they've made him stronger. Moscow, then, is in no mood for ultimatums, and it will continue to insist on its innocence. Sarah Rainsford, BBC News, Moscow. Well, during the day, Scotland Yard has given further details about the movements of Sergei Skripal and his daughter Yulia in the hours before they became critically ill. Counter-terrorism police say the investigation will take many more weeks, but the prime focus now is discovering exactly how the poison was administered. Our Home Affairs correspondent Daniel Sanford has the latest from Salisbury. This evening, with nerve agent contamination still a huge concern, police were working at the pound where Sergei Skripal's car was found after being towed away from Salisbury Town Centre. Britain's most senior counter-terrorism detective warning today that the complex operation in the city will last many weeks. We are sifting and assessing all evidence available and we are exploring all investigative avenues. This includes extensive CCTV footage from across the city and over 380 exhibits so far. Detectives now believe Yulia Skripal arrived at Heathrow Airport from Russia on the afternoon of Saturday the 3rd of March. The next day, the day of the attack, she and her father Sergei drove into Salisbury in this red BMW. Police are asking anyone who saw the car between 1 and 1.45 that Sunday to come forward. At 1.40 that afternoon, they parked on the upper deck of the Sainsbury's car park, from where they walked past a small park to the Mill pub. After a drink, they headed to the Zizi restaurant, where they were between 2.20 and 3.35. They then headed back to the park, where at 4.15, they were found desperately ill on a bench. Today, police said that Detective Sergeant Nick Bailey, who also became seriously ill after getting contaminated, was making good progress. The two people targeted in the attack, Yulia and Sergei Skripal, are still in intensive care here in Salisbury Hospital, where staff are having to use special precautions because of the military-grade nerve agent. They're both in a critical condition, but they are both still stable, which means they're not getting significantly worse. I understand that she is doing slightly better than he is. We still don't know if detectives have a specific suspect in this unique and challenging investigation. They said they wouldn't be making that public at this stage. Daniel Sanford, BBC News, Salisbury. So where do we stand after all of today's developments? In a moment, we'll have the latest from our correspondents in Moscow uh, and in Downing Street. First in, here in the studio, our security correspondent, Gordon Carrera. And a sense, Gordon, of how challenging this investigation is now. It has been a very challenging investigation, more challenging, I'm told, even than a counter-terrorism investigation, particularly because of the forensics and the contamination. It was, I understand, only on Saturday night they were able to identify the exact type of nerve agent used. And that, of course, then led to those warnings to the public the following morning on Sunday. That's nearly a week after the incident itself. We also got a sense today of just some of the broadening lines of inquiry for the police. There have been a lot of uh, questions about other deaths of Russians and people connected to Russia over the last 10 years. And today the Home Secretary said she'd asked the police and MI5 to look at some of those to see if there really were suspicions. Now that was in the morning. Then in the afternoon we learnt that the police were investigating what they called an unexplained death in New Malden, just south of London. Now we understand that the individual concerned is Nikolai Glushkov. He is a Russian businessman, he was a Russian businessman. Crucially, he was a friend of Boris Berezovsky, an arch-critic of Vladimir Putin, who in turn is one of those whose deaths is considered suspicious. Now, there's no uh, sign at the moment that this death is suspicious. Uh, there's no sign of a link to Salisbury. It could be entirely uh, natural causes. But you get a sense from the way the police are treating it, using counter-terrorism command to investigate, that they feel they've got to take it seriously because of this changing context of what might be possible 
But that challenging investigation in Salisbury is certainly the main focus. Gordon, uh, once again, thanks very much. Gordon Carrera there for us. Well, let's go straight to Moscow then and talk to Sarah Rainsford, our correspondent there. This deadline imposed by Theresa May is fast approaching, Sarah. We've had a sense of the response in Moscow. What is your reading of things there? Well, I think there's uh, no sense that Russia is planning to comply with that deadline. In fact, we've heard quite firmly that unless London hands over a sample of the nerve agent it says was uh, used, then Russia will ignore this deadline. So I think if there are any lights on there in the Kremlin tonight, then it's not people in their offices worrying about that deadline. But what we have heard today is that if there are sanctions from the UK, then Russia will respond to that. And specifically on one thing, the Foreign Ministry has said tonight that uh, if the pro-Kremlin channel are RT were to be closed down in the UK, then no British media would remain working here in Russia. Now, uh, beyond that, she was also on television here tonight uh, reminding viewers of Mr Putin's recent speech when he revealed all the new nuclear weapons that Russia has in its arsenal. After that, she said uh, nobody should be issuing Russia with ultimatums. So that's a sense of the mood here in Moscow tonight. Sarah, many thanks. Sarah Rainsford with the latest in Moscow. Let's go live to Downing Street then and talk to our diplomatic correspondent, James Landale. Once this uh, deadline has passed, James, what's your sense of what the next 24 hours could bring? Well, tomorrow the Prime Minister will convene her National Security Council. She'll be briefed on the investigation and the expected lack of Russian response to her ultimatum. She and her ministers will then decide just how robust and extensive they wish to be in their response to uh, what they see as Russia's involvement in the Salisbury attack. Now, those decisions have yet to be made, but we can detect, I think, some patterns. One, I think the government is very determined to make sure that this response is far more res robust than the response given in to... Uh the murder of Alexander Litvinenko more than a, a decade ago. Second, I think tomorrow will be very much the first stage of, a, of what is going to be a staged response. And the focus tomorrow will, will be on the UK domestic decisions, the unilateral action that Britain can take. So we're talking expulsion of diplomats, we're talking of financial sanctions, travel bans on Russians who have their wealth, wealth here. Then the question will be in the 24 hours ahead is how Russia responds. The Russian embassy here in the UK tonight has just a few moments ago said, look, if those calling for Russian diplomats to be expelled clearly don't care about global Britain and its diplomats in Moscow. So a clear threat there of a tit-for-tat expulsion response if that's the decision that the British government makes tomorrow. James, once again, thanks very much. James Landell there, our diplomatic correspondent in Downing Street. Yesterday, the Prime Minister had said Russia should tell us what it knows about the Salisbury attack by the end of today. Well, her time horizon was quickly hardened into a theatrical midnight deadline for the Russians to respond. And we are, well, we're not far off that. Today we heard a Russian response. Moscow says Britain must supply samples of the poison found on Mr Skripal and his daughter and anyway denies any involvement in the attack. It's perhaps unsurprising that the Russians are not playing ball, but it does leave a challenge for Theresa May as tomorrow, to mix metaphors, the ball now lies in her court. What does Britain do? Well, the helpful news for her is that from Germany to France and even to the White House, there is now increasing support from close allies. Here's Mark Urban. Britain set the timescale, little more than 24 hours for Russia to come up with answers on the poisoning in Salisbury. But it's a type of pressure that's not likely to cow President Putin. I think it's very difficult to see whether you know, the Kremlin is worried or not, but if we judge purely by what is in the Russian press and what is in the Russian newspapers, it is not the front pages uh, anywhere, including on the main internet uh, uh, websites. Uh, and it doesn't seem to be that this is the core issue which is going to dominate the remaining several days of the Russian election campaigning. It is quite remarkably absent for the kind of crisis that it's uh, looming on the horizon from the public opinion. And asked today about Britain's challenge, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov responded with one of his own. We immediately requested through an official note access to that chemical agent so that our experts could analyse it in accordance with the Chemical Weapons Convention. So time is short for Russia, but they aren't going to buckle. The march of minutes also prompts questions for the UK's allies. Since late last week, British diplomats have been consulting European capitals, often reluctant to sanction Russia in the past, 
gauging their appetite for tough action now. It's a very complicated issue. We have certain very large European countries like Germany, France and Italy where the sentiment is not as um, firm on Russia as we see in other countries. So it is still an open question, but uh, I think there is a un universal condemnation of this kind of um, attack. But what the EU will do is, is still not very clear. And of, unfortunately, we have seen in the past that, uh, that sometimes tough, tough talk have not been followed by concrete action. And President Trump, often assailed by critics for being in Putin's thrall, says Russia must now provide clear answers. It sounds to me like they believe it was Russia, and I would certainly take that finding as fact. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be organized in <laughs> Russia. For many European countries, the question may be whether they're prepared to boycott the Football World Cup in Russia. Germany are the reigning champions, but interestingly, even Germany's best-selling tabloid could be ready to advocate a boycott. I think there are things beyond football. So in the case that, uh, for example, um, Prime Minister May would ask for a British boycott of the World Cup and would ask um, NATO allies in, the, in Europe, in the West, to join into that boycott, um, I would say uh, we, you know, as a newspaper or a news organization, wouldn't uh, uh, wouldn't be in favor of turning down that request. We would be in favor of supporting that request. And as the last hours of Mrs. May's ultimatum trickle away, it's time also for her to decide what steps the UK should take on its own. From expelling spies in the Russian embassy, which today tweeted out a series of messages warning Britain against tough action, to imposing so-called Magnitsky law type sanctions on Russian officials, or even using GCHQ capabilities against the Kremlin. Cyber countermeasures uh, are something that has to, by definition, happen um, in the shadows, so to say, in the classified domain, through the intelligence agencies of the British government, of European governments and the United States. Uh, this is also something that's been discussed uh, during the Obama administration in the United States during the election interference, um, whether the U.S. should you know, for example, um, have a more offensive cyber strategy against Russia uh, to maybe have intelligence communities leak information about corrupt Kremlin officials, where their money is, how they're using Western financial institutions to hide their stolen uh, money and to launder that money. Uh, I think these are all potential options. The choices are many, but the dilemmas are cute. A nerve gas attack on British streets may be an unprecedented outrage, but the response, its extent, and even what it's meant to achieve are all the subjects of fierce debate. Mark Urban there. Mark's here now. Our political editor, Nick Watt, is uh, with us as well. We'll come to Nick in a moment. Mark, just update us on the investigation events around Salisbury today. Well, we've known for really for a couple of days that identifying the agent suddenly recast the uh, investigation and they're looking further back and as a result of what we've learned today we now can see that it's a window of between one and a half and four and a quarter hours during which they think this happened uh, before they got to the pub in the centre of Salisbury and in that window of time uh, that the car is very important. Uh, they're still saying though that they don't know how and when the poison was dispensed. There was some speculation around the uh, community or within law enforcement that there was some kind of method of dispensing it inside the car that would not appear to be the case from what the police have said today the car is though very important and where it was during 40 minutes after they would left home before they arrived in the town center much longer than is needed for that journey but and i think this is the key thing we've heard from the police they're still saying there is no subject of interest or suspect mm. and they must be keen to make a determination of someone of that kind. Yeah. Which is why they want, if you saw the red BMW, to... to Soon, to, to, yeah. To, to, the the yeah. pressure is on. Mm -hmm. Nick, well, Theresa May, talk about pressure being on. She's going to stand up and say, talk about whatever the Russians have responded to her. Uh, what, 
what intel do we have as to what she might do? Well, I understand uh, there will be a substantial response from the Prime Minister in the House of Commons tomorrow, but we will not see the full range of measures from the UK for two broad reasons. In the first case, there will be things that the UK will do that they will not want to advertise. And in the second place, there is an assumption that Vladimir Putin will retaliate, and therefore the UK needs some space to be able to respond to that. But there is also a hope that the UK will not be alone and there were two encouraging phone calls today with two NATO allies, Chancellor Merkel and President Trump. Nick, thanks. Right, well, in a further development today, it was confirmed that counter-terrorism police are leading an investigation into the unexplained death in London yesterday of a man believed to be Russian businessman Nikolai Glushkov. Now, Mr Glushkov sought exile in Britain after being convicted of fraud in Russia and had become, apparent, had become a vocal opponent to President Putin. There seems to be no evidence linking this latest death to what happened in Salisbury, but the timing is obviously uh, very awkward as the world waits to see how Mrs May responds to the Skripal affair. So let's discuss that now, uh, that response. I'm joined by Andrew Mitchell, Conservative MP, former Secretary of State for International Development. He's leading a cross-party group of MPs preparing to back a Magnitsky amendment to the government's sanctions bill. Also with me is the Washington Post columnist and LSE professor Anne Applebaum. And in Washington is Andrei Ilyarinov. Uh, he was chief economic advisor to uh, Mr. Putin and is now a senior fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Global Liberty and Prosperity. Um, I wonder if I can start with you, Mr. Ilyarinov. Um, where do you think we go when it really it, it, it looks as though the Russians are somehow not taking the British complaints even, even very seriously? Well, that's not surprising. Uh, it's a traditional, uh, a traditional approach and traditional response of the Russian authorities to uh, such and similar actions. Just let's remember what happened with Mr. Litvinenko case when he was poisoned in uh, Britain 12 years ago. So it's not a surprise. Uh, what is actually uh, more surprising, the lack uh, of response from the British side or from the Western side on all these cases of aggression, whether it is against Britain, as it was in year 2006 and in year 2018, or against Georgia in year 2008, or against Ukraine in year 2014, against uh, okay. in, in the United States during the intervention in the US election and so on. We know, we know the, the charge sheet. OK, so just tell us what we should be doing. What would you do? Right, OK, there are to be uh, at least uh, two sides of potential response. One is uh, punishment of those who are responsible for all those acts of uh, crimes, uh, aggression and terror. It should be absolutely clear said that is a terrorist act. Uh, but the other one is uh, much more uh, long term and much wider response from Britain and not only from Britain, but from the uh, White West. Uh, because the final and long-term goal of such long-term strategy is to have Russia free, democratic, rule, rule of law yeah. based, and peaceful. Uh, because if and what's uh, the these action? retaliation what do we will do? be... Sorry to interrupt. What, is, what do we actually do? We know the goal. We know what we want. What do we do? No, uh, you don't know yet, because there is no consensus in the Western world. Actually, there is no even discussion about what is the long-term goal of such strategy. Actually, there was no much discussion about the strategy itself. So that is why it is, first of all, necessary to come to understanding for the Western countries, for, for the Western world, what does West want from Russia. That was the main question that you posed at the very beginning. Yeah. What kind of Russia would you like to see? OK, but let's, let's hold that there. Andrew Mitchell, it does feel as though we don't have a strategy here. We're lurching after headlines that will work on Thursday and tactics that might work. Is there actually a strategy for a sort of medium-sized country like Britain to have sanctions that work against someone like Russia? Well, I'm sure there will be. It is comparatively early yet. We've had the statement yesterday from the Prime Minister, another one probably tomorrow. But the most important thing is that we should gather the evidence. So we're quite clear, we don't get this wrong, where culpability lies, how it was done, right. and put all this information it into may... the public domain through, in my view, the United Nations. Okay, so it may be, let's, first point, it may not be certain, it may be circumstantial. Is that good enough? 
we, we, we must be absolutely clear about what has happened, otherwise we won't carry conviction when we put it into the public domain through the United Nations right. so that our allies and other countries can see right. what was behind this and, and the threat that it poses to all of us. And is it premature for the Prime Minister to stand up tomorrow and pretend we're starting on a kind of a path tomorrow? Is there... I mean, that's our deadline, not their deadline. Nothing is going to follow from it. Do we need to do it that fast? Well, the deadline was to answer the two very pertinent right. questions she raised in the House of Commons yesterday. Right. And should she be tomorrow saying, OK, this is a response, or should she say, OK, now we will think about a response well, and gather a coalition of allies to help Well, her. I think she'll take it to the next stage. She okay. will t say what additional evidence is now available, how she's going to put it into the public domain and where, right. and what are the immediate consequences of that. Right. Anne Applebaum, same question to Andrew Mitchell to you. I mean, where, where are you on it? Well, the nature of your question, I think, shows what's really the most important point here, which is that Britain needs to be part of an alliance. Um, it needs to be part of the European Union. It needs to work with European Union allies. Um, unfortunately, this is the worst possible moment for Britain to be leaving the EU, just as Russia is, becomes uh, revanchist and resurgent in all, all kinds of spheres, not just... Um, inside Britain. And so uh, the, the, the most that Britain could do to revive those alliances, right. um, uh, the better. So it's all about um, the allies. So it's, it's, it's all about the allies, but it's also about understanding where we do have power and where we do have influence. Look, Russians keep their money, their wives, their children, their property in this country and in Western Europe. Um, ending that practice, ending the use, the, the money laundering that Russia does through here, enforcing our own laws, using right. our laws about uh, mysterious money. You know, we're allowed now to go and ask people, where does your money come from? Making those laws work, pushing it through, ending, ending the, the practice of using shell companies to buy property in Britain, to buy companies in Britain. All of that could make an enormous difference okay. as it, to, to, to Russia's Mi feelings about this country. Andrew Mitchell, you would agree with that because you support the Magnitsky Amendment, which is basically designed to do to, to aid. Yes, that's exactly right. It enables us to take serious measures against those who are conducting themselves yeah. in this way from, from Russia. And, and Parliament, I think, will want to see something like the full Magnitsky Amendment that's been introduced in America and Canada and three European Let's talk, countries. Let's just a quick, quick one on a couple of other options. World Cup boycott. Surely pointless unless everybody boycotts the World Cup. Us boycotting it on our own is just going to make them... I think, I think it's silly to involve sports, and I also think it's silly to talk about banning RT. It's not influential or important. The, the Russian it's not state necessary. Yeah. Um, we need to use the leverage that we have in the areas where, you know, where we can control things that really matter, and as I said, working in conjunction with other allies. I mean, imagine if we could end run, uh, Russia, uh, Russian money laundering all across Europe. Imagine if we could begin working with the EU... Um, to, to close all those all loopholes. All comes back to what everybody I else is doing. I, I wouldn't ban RT, actually. I mean, during the... It seems to be one of the sort well, of most talked the, about options, during is banning the, a broadcaster. During the Russian, the Russian bombing of Aleppo, uh, I spoke out on RT against it, and they carried the interview, and they carried it in Russia. So, you know, I don't, I don't think it's sensible to ban RT. Well, it, 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 gives, it gives credence to the idea that our broadcasting is politicised in the way that theirs is. Well, well it? I'm not sure it does, because, of course, it's broadcast across Europe as well as mm. into Russia. But I think the fact that they carried very hostile interviews uh, in the way that yeah, they did... They, they means, do that means as a way of laundering yeah. themselves yeah. into you respectability. Can, I, I think you, it is, it's not sensible to ban them. In okay. Let me go back to Andrei Ilyarionov. Um, Andrei, did, of all the kind of things, the specific things you've heard, I know you want a big grand strategy and the, the, the West to sort it, align itself here. What would you do specifically if you were the UK? OK, let me uh, just address what my colleagues already said. Uh, everybody should understand, this is war. This is aggression against Britain. It's aggression against other countries. It's aggression uh, against the West. So, and in the war and in aggression, there is no silly responses. That would be enough or not enough responses. So that is why all these instruments that have been mentioned already, uh, dealing with illegal fi uh, fi uh, fisc financial assets yeah. in London, or Magnitsky Act, or RT, or Volcap, all of them are important. All of them are important, okay. but they are only elements, some elements of possible grand strategy. And that is why you don't need to miss and do not need to forget about the long-term goal of such a strategy. Right. Okay. And that is why those instruments could be not only four, but dozens and hundreds 
if you really wanted to win this war okay. and to give a response to such an aggression. Point made. Thanks ever so much, Andrei Ilyarianov Ilyari and Apple. But you're going to stay with us. We'll talk about you on our next topic. And Andrew Mitchell, thank you very much indeed. It's true as well. <laughs> by the weekend. Anyway, Aisha and Tom are here to Russia. What happens next? The clock ticking. The deadline passes, of course. Well, talk of icy blasts. Uh, we're going to get a phenomenally icy blast from the Prime Minister tomorrow in the House of Commons at uh, roughly quarter to one, I predict. When she stands up and uh, gives a uh, pretty powerful and um, groundbreaking statement uh, in response to Russia failing to answer her demand for an explanation to why their very high-grade military nerve agent was found carpeting much of Salisbury's streets after the assassination attempt on uh, Sergei Skripal and his daughter Yulia. The deadline is going to pass uh, in about 25 minutes' time. And we now already know, without Russia giving an explanation for how the nerve agent got there, a credible one... It was never one. going to, was it? Let's be honest. No, and it was never going to, and so the PM's going to call out Russia, accuse Russia of... Uh, state-sponsored uh, assassination uh, tomorrow, at least, and attempted it, as well as an un unlawful use of force against another country, which is a, a breach of one of the founding UN principles from 1945. Uh, so this is going to be a really big deal. Before all this, which is quite frankly something we knew was going to happen, because we knew she was going to say that because we knew Russia weren't going to tell her the truth uh, about what their nerve agent was doing on the streets of Salisbury, there's been a very powerful day of language. Britain and Russia exchanging some, some pretty hefty insults, uh, including one that um, the Daily Mail picks up on the front page. Uh, well, you a say that, nuclear but threat, or yeah, but the, yes, allegedly, well, anyway. Well, yeah. that, sorry, did I steal your thunder there? Um, the whole point no, no, was that... But it will steal yours. <laughs> <laughs> Never steal um, Anna's thunder. Yes, <laughs> this came out that it, it appeared that Russia was saying, don't threaten us, you know, a nuclear state. But actually, the it was mistranslated originally. And in fact, they were saying a nuclear power like Britain should not make this sort of ultimatum, i.e. give us 24 yes. hours, when legally you should be given 10 to yes. reveal chemical weapons or not. The, so the, this is a mistranslation, and really yeah. language is very important at this stage, isn't uh, it? The foibles of mistranslations are extremely high uh, moments of tension across the world. You know, could lead to a potential outbreak of war, so we hope that doesn't happen. However, there were a huge amount of other threats going on from uh, Russia today. The Russian embassy were a, a, a permanent series of tweets throughout the afternoon saying, watch out, if you do this to us, we'll do this oh. to you. So. Russia was really building up the tempo today, getting, getting very, very aggressive indeed, largely because they want all this. Remember, they have precipitated this crisis by leaving a calling card all over Salisbury streets. It could have only been Russia and, quite frankly, the Kremlin and Vladimir Putin who orchestrated and authorised this uh, because they want a confrontation. It makes Putin look good three or four days before his president elections on Sunday to get in a good old row with, with slimy old Brits who he can then retaliate back against either tomorrow or Thursday. Well, I mean, where to begin with this story? I mean, it makes the script of McMafia look pretty tame. And, you know, Amber Rudd says that there are now... Uh, there is now an inquiry into allegations of another potential 14 other deaths that have links to the Kremlin. So it looks like, um, you know, the Russian services are murdering people. We are having people killed um, with absolutely, you know, no problem. You know, they are behaving with absolute sort of impunity. And, it, you know, you have to keep a cool head in this because we don't want this to escalate into World War Three. But at the same time, you know, we are one of the most important capital cities and countries and we can't just have Russian people getting killed on our streets. And, in fact, an interesting photograph there um, in The Times that British police are now investigating the deaths of all three of these people. Yeah. The very latest, the man on the left, Nikolai Klushkov, who's been found dead. Some suggestion, although we've not had it confirmed, of strangulation marks around his neck. I don't know if you in The Sun have. Um, but certainly it does appear that there are elements that need to be investigated now. But the question is, you know, where do we go from this? I mean, I do agree with Tom that Theresa May will have to talk very, very tough, and it's an important moment of leadership. It's above party political um, sort of spats. It's about, you know, it's about national leadership. I think people are genuinely worried about this. And if you look at the geopolitics, they are very, very scary. I think Putin is trying mm. to assert himself. You have President Xi, who is the strong man of China. You have Kim Jong-un, who is, you know, going to have these talks, allegedly, with, with Donald Trump soon. And Putin is the other big strong man in the world. And for a long time, people have been worried about what Russia's doing. Remember, they just went into Ukraine 
and took over and just occupied and then just annexed a huge section of Ukraine. We all said, oh, that's terrible, but we couldn't do anything. We know Russia has been interfering with, with other countries' um, elections. There's been cyber attacks. What Russia and what the experts around Russia say is what they love doing is causing disruption, chaos, um, you know, as much of distraction as possible. And I think we've got to be really, really worried about this, but what can we do? Which takes well, us to the inside pages of the Times, does it you, not? You, you may ask. By the way, there is one more world leader okay. who, who really wants to um, uh, make a big song and dance about this, and that's Theresa May. Because though she doesn't want to compete with President Xi or Vladimir Putin in, in the strongman stakes, it doesn't do her any damage to be seen as, as a strong leader and a, and a war leader. Uh, and a lot of Tory MPs speaking to you today were really hoping she delivers quite a, quite a powerful rebuke tomorrow because uh, she's quite frankly quite good at doing that sort of stuff. Anyway, what can we Apart do about from it? Boris Johnson. What can we do about? Uh, let's not go to Boris Johnson. We're going to have a, we're going to have a <laughs> press <laughs> review entirely free of Brexit. Oh no, I, I just I just <laughs> screwed it up. Anyway, we're going to do it. So, what can we do about the Russians? Yeah. Can we really do anything against them in terms of economic sanctions without acting with America or Europe, who, although they're saying nice things, may not be ready to, to commit their bucks to where their mouths are today? Mm. Well, there is actually something we can do, and the Times hits, hits the nail on the head, and it says, go after Putin's cronies. The people who are keeping him in power mm. are the oligarchs who control all of Russia and control the wealth, control the resources, whose support he, he really needs to stay where he is. A lot of them have huge amounts of wealth stored in London, either being uh, banked in the city of London or being rinsed, dare I say, the, the slightly more uh, criminal elements through uh, various uh, city houses or very nice houses themselves. And there is Roman Abramovich, it's there on Millionaire's Row in, in Kensington. Mm. Or uh, Oleg Deripaska's yacht, by the way, uh, Peter Mandelson just took on Oleg Derek Pasca, uh, the aluminium king, as a, as a client this morning, the Financial Times reported. Once had a famous a, meeting, didn't they? Aside. They had a small bit of famous so meeting on that. Isn't that next to your is, house, that one? Isn't that next to your it's, house? It's not even the right side of the river. <laughs> <my, my, laughs> is your house my, a bit bigger than that? My, my house isn't even in North <laughs> London. It's, 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 it's South London. In, 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 uh, I used to... I could have lived there if, if Bromwich wasn't living there. Anyway, the point being... We can go after the oligarchs uh, under a really interesting a bit of legislation that Congress passed in the States back in January, uh, which mm -hmm. is something called the Counting America's Adversaries Through Sanctions Act. Not so catchy, but it basically says it doesn't matter if they haven't done anything wrong. The way to get Putin is by getting <clears throat> people close to him who have profited hugely from Putin's regime. These people have made countless fortunes but that very that very act um that president trump hasn't actually enacted yet is the cause of great consternation by democrats in the u.s house of representatives because he still hasn't done anything about that but he's missed two actually with nice idea that's what I'm but saying. but what tom yeah. is saying yeah. actually has merit because the opposition leader the main opposition leader in russia has actually called on theresa may to do just that to use what power she has here with these Russian oligarchs. And he says, look, you should be cracking, you should be freezing assets, you should be denying visas. And actually he says that you, we have legislation here, we have the 2010 Bribery Act, which we could use as well, because part of the, some of the clauses in there say that if there's bribery of foreign public officials, you know, that can be done, even if that's happened in another country, it can be sort of, you know, we can use some of our laws here. So I think there is merit in mm. that. But, but, but ta targeting a bunch of rich people, does that really solve the problem of what to do about President Putin? Yes, it does. Well, going with impunity it does. around the world, doing whatever he wants. It's the way to hurt him. It's the way his... We've already hurt him. We've already said 138 representatives can't come here and five state-owned banks can't get capital, raise no, capital that, in London, that and all that stuff that came with the... That, that hasn't sanctions. had any effect because he's, he's mm. still poisoning people left, right and centre on our streets. That what will really hurt Putin is the money, the people he relies on, his support network, and his own... Putin is uh, estimated by some to be the world's richest man. £80 billion pounds he has hidden away over different places. You can bet your bottom dollar, MI6 and GCHQ have got a pretty idea where that is, freezing some of his own money and even exposing where that money is, that would really embarrass him to all but those Russian voters who he wants to vote I do for him think on you have a, I think th th these are small measures, but these could be the equivalent of a sort of Band-Aid over an axe wound because he does act with impunity. He just does what he wants. You know, I have friends who are Ukrainian for the bit that is still Ukrainian. They live in fear of when the next you know, wave of Russian infiltration is going to happen. And what a lot of people feel is now, in terms of where our world politics is, we can't do anything. Mm. You know, we can if have we lots of strong If we can't do anything when, when Russia is accused of shooting down a passenger jet, 
then what is going to happen now? It's, it's but kind of we point. live in a world where it's very we, we are quite impotent in terms of our foreign mm. policy. And that is that we talk about this quite often, whether it's Syria, whether it's what's happening in Myanmar, whether it's North Korea. You know, we can all talk tough, mm. but actually it's quite hard to, to really go in and do anything. I've been